Okay, Chu, I think you can start. We're recording now. Hey. Right, hi everyone. Good afternoon and thank you for making time to be with us here in uh, CVSKL. Um, I want to firstly thank Medtronic for making this event possible. Uh, I think we've all been through very unusual circumstances and I don't think that things are going to improve uh, in the near future, but at least we can still see each other and share knowledge uh, with each other. Um, in, as we run through this program this afternoon, I would like to encourage if you have anyone who has got some questions, uh, please go to the question and answer uh, slot for you to key in your questions uh, rather than the chat, chat uh, column. And we will try to address all the questions, some live and some uh, via written uh, response. So in this uh, one hour program, we hope to keep the time. Um, we actually decided to speak or share about the role of uh, transcatheter aortic valve implant or replacement in patients with aortic stenosis. Now this technology has been really getting a lot of attention of late, uh, especially in this part of the world. I think it's a lot driven by the data that's been coming up in the last one or two years. We are well behind some of our Western counterparts. And so here today we see we have a lot of representation, not only from Malaysia, but from around the region. So many friends, thank you for dialing in. And I'm sure that some, a few of us are experts already, but there are many of us who are still new to this technology. And so we hope to go through maybe not a single, but a few sessions of Tavi uh, like uh, educational material to share and expand the uh, indication and the use of this uh, technology for our patients. So in the next, um, 15, 20 minutes, I will commence by giving a brief presentation about when we should consider Tavir for our patients with aortic stenosis. Then Dr. Rosli, he's my colleague here in CBSKL. I think he needs no, um, no uh, introduction. Everybody knows him. He is uh, the main person who helped to start the program here in CBSKL. He will share one of the cases that we did not too long ago and we are open to discussions, let it be a two-way communication between us. Okay, so let's, let me bring up my slides and then we can move on to the first segment of our presentation. Okay. Right, so we like to talk to everyone here with regards to the therapy for aortic stenosis. When or why would you even want to consider a transcatheter approach? Very briefly, we will run through the background history of the uh, aortic stenosis and why this therapy is uh, having a, a sort of a gaining traction. To understand this technology and what it has become, we also like to look at the historical basis of how we got to this level today. Before we navigate through some of the data, uh, in fact, this will be the crux of the presentation of uh, Tavir against surgical aortic valve replacement. And finally, getting all this data together, what are the things that we should consider uh, as a hard team uh, approach in terms of what is best for our patients? Now, today, Tavir or teotic, uh, transcatheter aortic valve implant is mainly to treat aortic stenosis. We will see in coming years expanded indications to include aortic regurgitation. There are technological issues to overcome, but as it is today, it is for aortic stenosis. It is an important condition to treat because we know that it is the most frequent acquired valvular heart disease in adults. Those above age of 65, at least one in 20 may have significant aortic stenosis. And as the population ages, we're gonna have more and more people who need treatment for aortic stenosis, the degenerative aortic stenosis. These patients, when they become symptomatic, they have very high mortality risk. In fact, if you look at the development of the classical symptoms of aortic stenosis, 
Once they have angina, their life expectancy is expected to be less than five years. With loss of consciousness, it's between two to three years. And once heart failure develops, you know that they are towards the terminal stage of the natural history where the life expectancy is expected to be not more than one to two years. Okay, uh, Ramat says she can't hear me. Can the rest hear me? If yes, I will carry on and we we'll yeah, check. Clear, too. clear. Okay, but someone wrote that Ramat couldn't hear me. Okay, let's carry on then. You see that the natural history of aortic stenosis, there will be a progressive decline or the severe, severity of the stenosis would increase with time. These patients are totally asymptomatic for many years, but once they become symptomatic, see that the survival curve just drops precipitously. When they become symptomatic, the only treatment that we've had today, today is actually to replace the valve surgically. And that has been the standard of care for decades. But we have to keep in mind also, these patients have been usually elderly. There is a significant operative mortality and morbidity. Even if they are asymptomatic, there's also some risk involved. But if you look at the reality is that people or patients who need surgical aortic valve replacement, up to a third of them do not get the necessary therapy. Many reasons for that, but many of these reasons are related to the patient's comorbidity and the high surgical risk. Even in the US where you have the, probably the highest uptake in uh, TAVR or TAVR today, you see that many of these patients do not get treatment, whether by surgical or transcathetal route. So there is really a big population that is left unattended that we need to treat. What more in parts of the developing world that there are a lot of patients that are left untreated, whereas we can actually improve their prognosis. The idea behind transcathetal approach to balloon or to aortic therapy comes from the fact that, again, many of these patients cannot be treated by surgery. In 1985 was the first attempt to treat a severe aortic stenosis with balloon valvuloplasty, again done by the, the main person who is in the forefront of this technology, Dr. Alan Cribier. This patient actually improved after balloon valvuloplasty, significant reduction in the transvalvular gradient, and were asymptomatic for the next two years. This really received a lot of positive response from the community, but we know clearly that the re stenosis rate is very high, and we know that there is no demonstration of mortality improvement in balloon aortic valvuloplasty. Then the opportunity came in such a, a situation that we can only attempt any new technology if the patients are beyond help surgically. And that opportunity came on the 16th of April in 2002. This 57 year old gentleman, excuse me with a lot of comorbidity. He was admitted for subacute lower limb ischemia because of an occluded aortic femoral bypass. He also had previous lung cancer and chronic pancreatitis. LV function was extremely poor, year for 12%. He had been turned down three times by the surgical team. So he was referred to Hospital Lilly in Switzerland for balloon valvuloplasty. He improved, but within 48 hours, he went into cardiogenic shock again. So at that point in time, it was clear that the only option he had was to put in a transcathetal valve, which was only very experimental. And it was this device that was crimped onto a 30 mm balloon, just like what Gunsik did in his kitchen when he created or made the first stent. And this was the stent that was passed through a transfemoral route from the right side, transeptally, going up across the aortic valve and the valve was implanted. And you see the beautiful results of very minimal perivalvular leak and good implantation depth. So that was the first and the beginning. Today, you see how Tevor has exploded. Between 2017 to expected in another five years time, the number of Tevor procedures is going to increase threefold worldwide. Here in US alone, from the STS registry, you see how, in blue, surgical aortic valve replacement is slowly coming down a bit, but Tavir is just picking up so fast, and it crossed over around 2015, 2016. But if you look at the take-up around the world, it's mainly the Western world that, high, that has the highest 
take up of this new technology. The rest of the world, I suspect, partly because of cost and reimbursement, that there is a lot of unmet needs. So we hope at one point, at some point in the future, the rest of the world can benefit from this technology. Therefore, now we look at patients who need a aortic valve replacement. These patients has been assessed in terms of suitability for procedure based on their surgical risk. There are patients then based on the STS score, anything above 8% is considered to be very high risk. Between 4 to 8 is considered low risk, uh, intermediate. Below 4, it is considered a low risk meaning a 30-day mortality of between 2 to 4 percent. So the assessment of the patient's suitability for this procedure has been traditionally based on the surgical risk, based on the STS score. There has been two platforms for Tevra that has been approved. This is the balloon expandable as well as the self-expandable system. So of course, when you start to try this technology, it can only be used for patients that are surgical rejects where the surgeons cannot operate because of various reasons. So this is the partner 1, 1B cohort using the balloon expandable stent. And these patients that cannot be operated, you see that at the point of two years, by one year in fact, there's already an improvement in all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. Therefore, when patients cannot be operated, Tever will improve the patient's survival. In a 1A cohort, these are patients with very high surgical risk. You see that at one year, there is non inferiority between the transcatheter versus the surgical approach to replace the aortic valve. They had till now up to five years report. You see that in the non operable group, the mortality benefit is maintained up to five years. In the patients with high risk, you see that the non-inferiority is also maintained in terms of mortality up to five years. So then with this trial, I think we are sort of more or less sure that there are these group of patients that really will benefit. And we had also evidence from the self-expendable platform. This is the core valve high-risk trial up to one year. You find that there's a reduction in all-cause mortality, which is, is significant. At five years, the curves do merge, but we still see that it's actually non inferior. Therefore, patients that are inoperable or patients that are high risk surgically for surgical aortic valve replacement, transcathetic aortic valve is the way to go for this group of patients. Now, I want you to take a step back and just pause for a while. We have seen that the evidence is quite clear for these high risk patients or inoperable patients that transcathetic can be used. But we realize that these trials has been using the first generation transcatheter valve. So really, this technology has improved by leaps and bounds over the last 10 years. What we saw from this trial may not be truly representative of what we are performing for our patients today. This self-expandable valve has gone through a number of iterations, and you find that the valves get better in terms of delivery, performance, and so on. So with the balloon expandable valves as well. So when we then move on from the high risk to the intermediate risk, when they first started this in a partner 2A trial, they were using the second or generation of the balloon expandable, which is Sipin XT valve, and compared to surgical aortic valve, you find that there is non-inferiority in terms of all-cause mortality or stroke at one, at one to two years. But then again, at that point in time, they already have a new iteration of the latest balloon expandable valve, which is the Sapien 3. And this was actually studied in an observational uh, manner in this uh, trial. And they actually compared intermediate risk aortic stenosis patients using the Sapien 3 with the surgical arm in a propensity match sort of manner. And what we find that if you use the new generation valves, you actually can achieve mortality in the intermediate risk group. Mortality is achieved, and not only that, it's all-cause mortality as well as definite reduction in stroke events. So what we're seeing now, at least even in intermediate risk, there is a mortality benefit. We use a new generation um, sort of platform. There is a lower stroke risk. And there are also other secondary endpoints which are improved, including bleeding, use of acute kidney failure, and less atrial fibrillation as well. Patients definitely have better quality of life with shorter hospital stay. 
The durability, of course, is a big question. The, self, the self-expandable stance has also been studied in the intermediate risk group. This is Firtavi, again, showing similar non-inferiority for mortality as well as the disabling stroke. And you find that most of this benefit is driven not by reduction in mortality, but reduction in stroke in the intermediate group. This is for the self-expandable platform. Uh, coming to what we have now, we have looked through patients from extreme inoperable risk to high risk to intermediate risk, that this transcatheter platform is a suitable option when compared to surgical valve replacement. Guidelines really need to keep up. The last iteration of the guideline from 2017 in ACC AHA has shown us that for high or inoperable patients, definitely TAVR is considered a class one indication. Patients with intermediate risk, you should consider TAVR as a class two indication compared to surgical AVR. But this is the big group that we are trying to understand. The low risk patients also will benefit from TAVR instead of just surgical alone. We are getting very excited because we have shown consistent benefits in the higher risk category. By right, it should show similar benefits in the lower risk categories. So these low risk patients were actually announced, the results were announced in both balloon and self-expendable in the ACC meeting last year, the Medtronic Evolute Low Risk Trial as well as the Partner Tree Trial. The Partner Tree, very briefly, again looks at low risk patients with a transcatheter approach, a transfemoral approach for the TAVR procedure using the latest Sapien Tree against surgical um, replacement and you find that at the end of one year, there is a reduction in the primary endpoint or death stroke and rehospitalization. Very significant. Again, this was not driven by mortality, by reduction in stroke, as well as hospitalization, borderline p-value significance. They had just one and a half months or one month plus ago in a virtual ACC meeting announced a two-year result showing that what we saw at one year was actually maintained up to two years in terms of the primary composite endpoint. Again, this was not driven by death, but by reduction in stroke, of, of which there is still a trend which became non-significant by p-value at the point of two years. Hospitalization for heart failure especially was still significant at the end of two years. Realize also, we must realize there is also a benefit for a transcatheter approach in terms of new onset heart failure against, surg- against surgery, but surgery is better in terms of new conduction abnormalities as well as valve thrombosis. The Evolute platform for the low risk patients again showed for these low risk patients, there is a reduction in the mortality and disabling stroke at one year, definitely a trend, although the p-value was not significant. And this was again, sorry, driven by reduction in stroke, which was basically significant. So what we're seeing really in the low risk platform, in the low risk group with the self-expanding uh, uh, stance or the uh, uh, travel pr- procedures, we have reduction in events, not so much by death, a reduction in stroke, as well great reduction in heart failure hospitalization. There are also key secondary endpoints. There's more pacemaker used in the uh, TAVR group, but the TAVR is better than surgery in terms of new AF bleeding events and acute kidney failure. So now we've gone through the whole spectrum from the highest risk to the lowest risk. You've seen very clearly we combine all this data in this meta-analysis is about 12% reduction in all cause mortality. So now, when you want to discuss your, with your patients, do they need a transcatheter option for the aortic valve replacement? We have seen that from a concept in 2002, whereby TAVI is considered only as an alternative when surgery cannot be performed. Can we now tell the patients that today, TAVI should be, in fact, the gold standard and surgery is only an option and TAVI cannot be performed. Well, a lot of us are keen to say that, and a lot of us are keen to say bye-bye to Sever. Well, I must again, maybe ask us to be a bit more sort of be real uh, in terms of interpretation of the data. There is so-called fact, and there's also an alternative fact. From is full of alter- alternative facts. I love Dr. Fauci's uh, gesture here. He's got a lot of alternative facts when you talk about testing or talk about 
uh, death rate from coronavirus or even the use of disinfectant uh, internally? Well, we have to be objective because if you look at these low risk groups, this is the partner tree exclusion criteria, which is very similar to the absolute low risk. They actually excluded patients with bicuspid valve, patients with severe aortic valve or LVOT calcification if they cannot be performed via the transfemoral route or they have complex coronary anatomy as well as patients with renal insufficiency. So when we say low risk, what do we actually mean? We are saying that these patients are low risk by means of the SDS score, but they are also at low risk of bad outcomes because these patients are suitable for a safe transfemoral procedure. They have good coronary osteo height, which means that they have less risk of coronary occlusion after deployment of the valve. These patients are not bicuspid in terms of the valve morphology. There's no severe calcification of the annulus as well as the LVOT. So really, I must say that this low risk sometimes can be deemed a misnomer because it is not representative of all comers low risk patients. I think when looking at this data, we should be objective rather than opportunistic in trying to promote the transcatheter procedure. Some patients still, I think, may be better served with a surgical approach. We know that there are a number of issues with TAVR. There will be immediate problems like perivalvular leak, needing for pacemaker, maybe a resource stroke, which is still there. But most of these immediate sort of risks have been circumvented or may be improved with the newer advances in the stand or the valve technology. There are longer issues which are real, which is your durability of the stand, which is still unknown. Issues with thrombosis of the valve, the need in the future for valve and valve when the valves degenerate, as well as coronary access. If you look at all these trials that have gone through from extreme to low risk, most of them are actually elderly, 80 years old. In the low risk, the average age was about 73 to 74, still old patients. We do not know what will happen to this valve if we implant them in a patient which is 40 to 60 years old. This notion trial, which is all commerce trial, at least up to six years, there is some evidence that the surgical valve may actually deteriorate maybe a bit more from the echo assessment, but there's no difference in the need for a valve re reintervention. But six years is still short. We need to go longer. We have seen example from the surgical valves. The valves can appear very well without any issue up to six years, and suddenly this surgical valve starts to deteriorate very rapidly. We need longer follow-up to be, to be sure. We also know that in a surgical biological valve replacement, you place a valve in a patient between 45 to 54 years old or younger, they have a higher mortality compared to a mechanical valve. So we need longer follow-up to see how these patients will perform. Be very cautious in putting them in younger patients. There will be definite situations where surgery has the upper hand. Patients will need a replacement because of endocarditis infection, severe calcification, possible embolic potential structures in the aorta, wide endless, or needing for other surgical intervention like coronary or other valve repair, presence of thrombus in the LV, and poor vascular access. So now, as we come to the point where we have enough data as today, the heart team is the main sort of group collective decision on what is best for the patient. We know that patients with the extreme risk, we must also realize there may be a situation where we have to say no, patients are too sick. If they are extreme or high risk, TAVR may be a preferred choice. In the intermediate risk group, we have both options to consider. We need more data before we recommend TAVR for all low-risk patients. The RCT evidence that we have gone through today has shown that TAVR against SEVER may potentially lower stroke, lower mortality, has less atrial fibrillation, and better hemodynamics and no scar. If you use this kind of evidence and talk to your patient, this kind of different scar appearance and the recovery potential is very attractive to the patient. And patients have quicker recovery, shorter hospitals with better quality of life. If you are old enough, you know you like Mick Jagger. You like to move like Jagger, right? Well, this is him. Six weeks after a terrible procedure, a new 75-year-old dancing like that. I don't think that he will be able to do this with undergone 
a surgical valve replacement. So really, these are the kind of potentials that we are telling the patient to can achieve if they go for a transcatheter approach. If you tell them all this, the decision between transcatheter or, or surgery usually is a slam dunk choice. But it is onus upon us to really to make the patient really understand, make an informed decision making, and temper the enthusiasm against the facts of what is better in the long run or short term uh, between the two technologies. There's of course an issue with cost. It is still very much an issue for many of us, but if you look at some of the modeling, like if you are from the US, the transcatheter approach in the long run is actually more cost effective than the surgical approach. So ladies, uh, friends, we have actually seen how TAVR has evolved from very niche procedure to really an integral part of our treatment for patients with aortic stenosis. We may say that yes, it may be the preferred therapy for many patients, especially the elderly one above 75, especially those with the highest surgical risk. We know that this technology will continue to evolve and advance. We think that the outcomes will actually be better in the coming years. There will be a broader indication as we have seen from very high risk to low risk patients. But the decision on what is best for the patient has to be heart team based. We have to consider beyond the surgical risk, but also the durability of the technology, the future care that the patient needs. We will need maybe some coronary procedure. We need to reaccess the coronary arteries. We may need a second valve procedure. We have to temper the patient's expectations as well as the cost involved. Thank you very much. Okay, great. I hope that you have um, enjoyed this presentation and we will be happy to take questions. But before I just stop my sharing, let's go back to our discussion here. Great. Okay, if you have any questions, please come on and uh, write in. If not, we will wait for your questions online before we answer, All right? And okay. sure. thank you very much for the uh, setting the stage, uh, an excellent uh, uh, lecture and you know, layout of where we are right now. Um, I'm seeing from Q&A, there are no questions as yet. Um, perhaps uh, maybe uh, we can try to go in and uh, illustrate a case and uh, subsequently uh, then wait for the questions to come in. Yes, please do. Yes. So I'll ask Dr. Rosli to take over the platform to share with you the case uh, of interesting case of uh, a tavern. I see that we have 50 over participants. That's a great number. Thank you so much for attending. Yes, now we're trying to uh, get it on. Now, presenter. Ice cream. Screen one. Screen one. Oh, okay. Screen two. Screen two. Right. Can, um, do you think you can see the slides now, too? Yeah, we got it. All right, okay. So uh, this is just a case illustration of a Tawi patient uh, that we did recently. And uh, this is a, he had a post mitral valve repair. Essentially, just to highlight uh, some of the things that Dr. Chu has stated in terms of how we work up the, this patient and then uh, going through with you uh, some of the procedural aspects. So just like to share this. Um, is a 76-year-old gentleman with uh, severe aortic stenosis, and he presented with congestive heart failure in November of last year. And after treatment of his uh, acute uh, congestive heart failure, uh, he, is, uh, he was then in, uh, in a functional class 2B. He had mitral valve repair in 2016. Unfortunately, he had three episodes of uh, infective endocarditis, which were treated successfully with uh, antibiotics a diabetic, gouty arthritis, signal kidney, and he has got a number of uh, things that has not been tied up yet and has not been investigated fully. Essentially, the, uh, the 
presence of Addison's disease uh, last year, curing hemochromatosis, and the finding of heptosmomegaly with portal hypertension. That is, at, yes, yet uh, at the point that we uh, manage him, there is no evidence to suggest any mitotic lesion. Um, and his angiogram in 2016 was normal. Uh, physical examination at a point he, when he presented to us, he was not technically at rest. There was ankle edema at, to the mid zone, or uh, rather the mid leg. Uh, he had mild pallor. His blood pressure is uh, 120 and with a regular pulse. And he had a very typical uh, aortic stenosis murmur at the left cell edge and base of the heart. His lungs were clear. So this is uh, his ECG. And you can see his narrow complex sinus rhythm. Uh, we did uh, 2D echocardiogram in his LV, if at all, is uh, mildly elevated, but LV function is uh, good, normal at 53%. Uh, this was an estimation, and uh, you can see the reason why uh, nowadays we resort to CT scan, because uh, if you to look, uh, I wonder whether you can see my mouse, uh, Chu? Uh, you know, yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay, we can see it. You can see my mouse, eh? Okay. So sometimes this is a calculation for aortic analyst, and uh, when it's so calcified, it can be uh, difficult to actually measure it proper, uh, accurately. Uh, so the analyst is uh, deemed to be about 3.2 here. Probably it's not uh, accurate. Uh, then we look at uh, the LB function. You can see the LB function is good. There is also mild regurg from the previous mitral valve repair. Uh, that's uh, again to show in the still image of uh, MR in uh, two uh, views. Uh, just to show an aortic valve that shows how heavily calcified it is in the right coronary cast and the non coronary cast. And uh, what we uh, uh, attained from the aortic valve area from VTI assessment was 0.6 m squared with a peak radian of 64 and a mean radian of 33 mmHg. I think we based a lot uh, on symptoms by the fact that uh, we also have a uh, uh, calculation by VTI. Okay, so a CT angiogram, I think, is now, uh, you know, it's uh, almost to me is mandatory because uh, from there we will get a lot of information, especially we will be able to assess and, uh, you know, select what is appropriate valve size uh, for this patient. So here you have, uh, we don't have. Um, uh, screen pointer, pointer options, right? Here's a pointer, All right? So if you see here, we are managing to measure the annulus, and you know uh, that the annulus of the valve is not round; it tends to be elliptical. Then we measure, we can also see and measure the LVOT. Uh, as we go a bit higher, then we the, we have the sinus of Valsalva diameter, the ST junction, uh, sinus tubular junction, and also the ascending aorta. And you can see the picture here clearly uh, seeing that uh, calcification plus uh, a tri leaflet aortic valve, so it's not bicuspid. Um, and we come up with a uh, with, we come up with a you know a, a assessment which is put in table, and uh, this is assessment done uh, by Medtronic, and we'll view and see whether we it is in keeping with our own assessment. So what you have is that when you look at the analyst. Uh, we will see that uh, the diameter is uh, mean and maximum diameter giving a mean diameter. We also look at the parameter, and this parameter uh, derives uh, the, and gives us uh, the, um, uh, the choice or the size of the valve that we should be using. If you're using Edwards, they tend to use area. We also look at the LVOT dimensions. We look at the iliac arteries, which I'll show you later. Uh, and uh, we also look at the other assessment, which is the ST junction diameter, sinus valsalva diameter, the height of the sinus val of the valsalva, and the coronal ostia from the annulus. So in this case, is, this is a, a big, uh, a large parameter and requires the, a large valve. And uh, if you look at the valve that has been chosen, which is a 34 mm evolute uh, R valve, these are the parameters that we are uh, you know, that we assess and see whether the patient's own uh, measurements comply with this. So this is a, a, what we term it as ideal if you have all these uh, parameters uh, which is uh, met, which are met. So this is the patient's own assessment and uh, from here we can calculate the parameter 
and, uh, and that parameter falls into a valve, which is a 34mm valve. So that's what we're going to choose. The 34mm valve, it's a 16-French uh, equivalent delivery system. If you use its own inline sheath, but if you, are, if you don't want to use uh, an inline sheath directly and you want to use uh, a femoral sheath, then you have to use a 20 French. But it doesn't really matter because uh, the patient fulfills all these criteria. Now, a sinus valve sulvahide that has been shown just now. We are also able to look at the angulation. The angulation from the annulus is 33 degrees, so this is ideal. Not recommended if it's more than 70. Can still do it, but it's going to be more difficult because it's difficult to get the device to pass through the aortic valve because it is more horizontal. So in cases like this, and we have had two patients of this nature, that we had to use a much stiffer or rather a much stronger support wire in the form of lunar wire. We also have a look at the iliacs, and you can see we look at number one, the diameter. And the diameter is clearly a large diameter, suitable for either an inline sheath, or if you want to use a 20 French sheath, the minimum is 6.6 .6 mm. At least, at least if you calculate uh, one uh, French is equivalent to 0.33 of a millimeter. We look at tortuosity, we are able to assess calcification, so you can see not much of calcification in the iliac. And uh, from this, uh, we can approach from either the left or the right. Uh, we tend to choose, of course, the less uh, uh, tortuous vessel, and the one nearest to the operator is so much easier. But uh, in this uh, scenario, in this patient, he had high bifurcation in both the femoral arteries. So one needs to be careful, one needs to be to puncture a bit higher. But if it's too high, then uh, one may have to consider uh, asking our vascular surgical friends to help us with the cut down. And if you're sharp, you can also see that uh, there's also a, a small intrarenal uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. It is not going to be a problem here, but just be careful when we wire, we must make sure that we don't get caught in the aneurysm as we, uh, we go up. So that is something that uh, we need to remember. Uh, one of the other things, uh, you know, it has been uh, suggested that uh, we should uh, implant it a bit higher because the fact that there's a renal, uh, there's a mitral valve ring, if you put it to be too much lower, the concern is you might impinge the opening of the mitral valve. So this is uh, what is uh, being mentioned. And, you know, we, when we discuss in this heart team to our surgeons, one of the surgeons clearly say, you don't have to be worried. There's a mitral valve ring there. So the frame is not going to impede on the mitral valve opening as long as it's not too low. And I think in the normal placement that we tend to do most times or not, it will not and it should not impair the uh, mitral valve opening. So that's uh, something of reassurance. So it's good to, to have a hard team discussion. So this is uh, some of, these are some of the procedural considerations. We said that the aortic valve is tricuspid anatomy because the bicuspid we have to treat slightly different. We have found that what is the suitable valve that we're going to use. We said that we're going to uh, do a pre dilatation with a 20 mm balloon. Uh, the device access, uh, in terms of vascular access, we're going to be careful because it has, they have both high bifurcation. The implant depth, was there were some concerns, but now we just say that it's not too, as long as it's not too low. And if we need to post dilate, we'll be using a 25 mm balloon because that is itself fits in and uh, with the annular size uh, that we measured by CT. So the TAVI procedure, in, uh, in the end, we did it under GA because uh, and for uh, certain reasons, patient was quite anxious. Uh, preliminary, uh, the neckline and the temporary pacemaker was uh, set in from the right internal jugular vein. The left femoral artery was punctured with the six French because the main device we planned was from the right side. So we cross over to the right iliac artery with a GR diagnostic catheter, and then we exchange with a pigtail catheter. Now, the, you know, the vascular access has to be uh, prepared first before we think about imaging the AV uh, node, uh, rather the, AV, uh, the AV, aortic valve. And uh, the reason is because vascular access is very important because if we don't do well, the risk of bleeding and uh, dissecting rupture in the aorta at the iliac arteries especially can occur, so you want to try to avoid that. So you, you do this first before you focus and concentrate on the aortic valve. 
there are a number of ways you can uh, puncture. You can puncture under ultrasound. You can puncture under fluoroscopy uh, uh, imaging, fluoros fluoroscopy roadmap, and that's what uh, we commonly do. But in the other manner, and this is what Chu did. Uh, he put in a pictorial catheter, and this is the picture taken, and this is just above the bite partition. So when you puncture, you puncture at the center of the pictorial catheter. And this is what he's trying to do. So, so during the time that we do this, someone actually looks and see whether the blood goes out because uh, uh, the person who, uh, who's puncturing won't see because he's concentrating on the uh, uh, II. So someone will have to see whether the blood goes out and one blood goes, goes out, then you can put in the wire. And following a uh, nine French sheath that was uh, uh, implanted or uh, put uh, inserted, we again took a small, uh, another picture just to ensure that we are above the bifurcation. Nothing is worse when you are inside the uh, SFA or profunda and the vessel is small and it cannot accommodate the sheath or the device that you want to do. So I feel that this is very important. At this point, we put in a one uh, probe light which is deployed. So we, don't, uh, we have gotten away from using two probe lights. We only use one probe light. And once it's deployed, we put in back the nine French sheaths and then we are ready to put in our 20 French femoral sheath. So excess uh, 20 French uh, femoral sheath was placed in, and this must do it under fluoroscopy. We actually put in a wire, exchange it with, with an, uh, a, a stiff uh, uh, wire, uh, unplugged wire. And uh, once uh, uh, it is across the uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, we put in the sheath, the 20 French sheath. Again, I must uh, uh, recommend that it uh, under fluoroscopy, and it has to go by feel. Especially when the the, uh, the uh, aortic valve, uh, aortic uh, artery size is just enough, or you know you've got to make sure that uh, you uh, don't force your way up. So you must go nicely up and not to force it up. Uh, then we then concentrate on the aortic root injection. So this is where the pigtail is. Usually we just use about 15 mils for the first uh, injection just to see. Uh, and make, make sure that we are very clear and seeing where the trileaflet are. And uh, in this case, you have to be very careful. This is not an acceptable uh, placement of the uh, uh, pigtail because it is in the non coronary cuts. You need to put it in the right coronary cuts. So this is then repositioned and then placed in the right cast. And then you can see, if you to take a picture, you will be able to see three leaflets in line. Okay? So the working views are in uh, the ones that we see in line, and it has also already been predetermined by the CT scan. So this has, is very important because uh, you need to make sure that you know exactly where the analyst is when you position your device. All right, so uh, this is crossing the aortic valve, and we tend to use an AL16 French with a straight tip ex uh, exchange teflon, and most times or not, uh, it is uh, quite easy to pass. Uh, rarely do we need to use, uh, um, you know, an, uh, a Turumo uh, straight wi uh, wire. So that's not necessary in most cases. So once it's there, then we push in the uh, AL1 catheter, and then we exchange this with a pigtail catheter. So this is where the curved tip Teflon catheter wire was then exchanged, and the pigtail was placed right in, because once we uh, change or uh, put the pigtail right until the apex, that is when we are going to exchange with the support wire. And this is a confida wire that is supplied by Metronic. So once the pigtail is in, in, we measure the peak to peak gradient and you can see there's a gradient about 45, a mean gradient of 39. So that's a baseline gradient. It is not going to be as high uh, as your echo, uh, preliminary echo because the patient is anesthetized and under GA. So that might affect the pressure gradient. It doesn't really matter anyway. Your assessment has been done in, in, uh, before this that he has severe aortic stenosis that requires treatment. So before we balloon it, as we said, we're going to balloon with 20 mm, we always uh, ask the valve to be loaded uh, and we check the alignment that is uh, proper loading uh, because you don't want it to be improper loading and you have difficulties when you deploy, start to deploy the valve. So once we have done that, we put in a confida wire, and uh, and you can see this confida wire. And if you notice, uh, unfortunately, this webinar I can't ask ask you uh, you know uh, uh, openly, 
But you can see this, that the wire is not at the apex. And we tried to push the wire down to apex and it will not go through. So this is poor wire position. Do not take shortcuts. Repeat whatever process that you have to before to make sure that you implant the wire right down at apex. So we had to go all over again, get the wire down, right into the apex, change with the pigtail character, and subsequently we are able to get the confida wire right at apex because you need support uh, for it, and uh, you know you need you need to make sure that support are trying to get the valve in, and also support to ensure that when you deploy the valve, it is going to be stable uh, uh, when you stable in terms when you deploy. So uh, then we take in a nucleus balloon, and this is a calcification, this much valve ring calcification, put under uh, you know uh, pace at about 180, the blood pressure goes down, and then you inflate. And this is done in the working view that has been determined before. And uh, if you don't do under uh, pace, make pay, rapid pacing and getting the uh, blood pressure to be low, then the valve will tend to slip in and out, and it will not have uh, effective blood dilatation. Plus, also, it might cause some, uh, you know, injury within and outside the heart. See, once we have done that, just to uh, note that this is a QRS complex before, and you can see that the QRS complex is a bit more broader. So, once again, you've got to be careful uh, when you deal with these situations because the chances of uh, complete EV block may be a bit higher. All right, so this is valve uh, deployment, slow deployment, and we go by looking at nodes. Uh, this is the tip, uh, this uh, marker, dark marker, is where the sheath is, and we start, uh, when we start to pull the, the sheath, this is the edge of the stem, and every, you have got, you can actually see lines. The first line is, we call the lines as nodes, the first line is 6 mm, subsequent line is 4 mm. And uh, this, as we start to deploy, you, uh, would want to take uh, some injections from time to time to make sure that your placement is correct. And as you start to deploy the valve, the nodes, you cannot, you cannot see the lines anymore because the lines are the ones that, you know, uh, 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 when, it's, uh, when the valve is uh, collapsed, they can see that you, it forms lines. When the, the valve starts to open, the lines go away. So this is, uh, you know, and I think at this point, it looks as if uh, the position is very is nice and we said that we're going to deploy a bit more. So we deployed it under test pacemaker pacing at 120 just to get the blood pressure to be low and for it to be stable. You must, we must always uh, you know, uh, gear ourselves towards what we term it as our landmarks. It can be a number. It's uh, like here, you can see the pigtail, but pigtail, remember, can move. Look at the calcification, so that's a landmark. The mitral valve uh, ring can also form as a landmark, but in this case, we tend, I tend to use more looking at the calcification. We deploy slowly. Now, the only time is when uh, the valve starts to open more and there's annular contact. It means to say that it pushes the native valve to the side and the native valve doesn't work uh, anymore. And your uh, TAVI device, every device doesn't function yet because it's not fully deployed. That's when the blood pressure tends to drop and you must deploy this quickly. And we tend to deploy at 80% and uh, you know there'll be some crack, crack, then you stop there because that's about 80%. Anything more, you will have uh, the, the, the valve will not be able to be recaptured anymore. So these are new devices which are recapturable. So this is the working view. We went away and uh, took a different view to uh, take away the parallax to try to superimpose the uh, uh, diamond rings. So remember, one diamond is 10 mm. So in this case, it looks as if it's about 6 to 8 mm, and I thought it was quite good. And uh, when it's quite good, then we sort of, we deployed fully. And at this point, the uh, two pushed in the device forwards a bit to relieve the system tension so that you don't inadvertently pull out the device. So you must relieve tension. Uh, and as it gets uh, released, you must look at these pedals and make sure that it's now uh, uh, released uh, fully because otherwise, especially with the old device, if you're not careful and it's still attached, when you pull out, you can actually pull out the device. The pigtail catheter, I'm not bothered anymore because uh, last time uh, we, we were asked to pull it out before we full deployment. That's too much to focus on. We then just to put a wire and once the pigtail is straightened out, then you can safely pull out the pigtail. This is the gradient after. You can see that uh, it's much better, but there is uh, a, a peak to peak gradient of 17 mm HG. And the QRS complex is not broad pulling the post TAVI deployment. But uh, we said we wanted to get the better results. Uh, we were very uh, uh, 
since um, we are very uh, you know uh, observant about this uh, complex, so we took in a, a nucleus 25 mm, uh, making sure that the balloon now is a bit higher than uh, uh, than the valve because you don't want to go too low because of risk of complete EV blocks much higher. And uh, then we, oops, sorry. Uh, let me see. I don't think I can. Can I move this? No. <laughs> uh, okay. So anyway, the balloon is. Uh, I think I need to take out the pointer first, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Let's see first. Okay. So here you can see and uh, that the uh, balloon is being uh, inflated once again under pacing of about 180 to bring the blood pressure down, uh, and it's. More, I mean, the valve tends to, you can see that it's opened up uh, much better than before. So this is the gradient after that, which I think is much uh, better. And he's still in sinus rhythm, which is good. There is no evidence of him dramatically severe AR because the pipe pulse pressure was not wide. And you can see a diacrotic notch, which is good. So, and uh, this is the final uh, results. And you can see that it's probably about 7 or 8 mm, but it's okay. There is no AR. So following the uh, procedure, vascular, we now put in one proglide and then end with an angiosil of eight French. Unfortunately, and, and that has helped us uh, a lot of times because sometimes we put two proglides, they tend to you know, constrict the uh, iliac arteries or common femoral artery, and you can have stenosis that you may have to treat with balloon angioplasty. Unfortunately, in this case, the wire came out and we had to manually compress for 90 minutes. So the compression took much longer than the actual uh, procedure. So, but at least in the end, there was no groin bleed. He was in but done stable. We did check uh, hemoglobin uh, that following day, and there was about two grams uh, reduction. We did not have to give um, uh, iron a blood transfusion. He stayed in ICU for one day. And lo and behold, four uh, hours after that, the QRS complex came back to a normal narrow rhythm, uh, narrow QRS complex, which is good. Unfortunately, however, the first uh, post procedure day, post RV day, and second post RV day, the QRS com complex uh, was more uh, was uh, became broader again. Uh, but he was in sinus rhythm. We took out the TPM, transferred him out from ICU, and just put him on telemetry, and he continued to be in sinus rhythm. This is the uh, Avilute uh, uh, RV device and a short axis view to show, and you can see that uh, the flow uh, did not show any paravalvular leak. Uh, uh, this is the Tavi device in place. It's a long axis parasol view, and you can see that the mitral valve opening is good. Uh, the mitral gurge seems to be a bit less in the post images. So I'll show you in the moving image afterwards. And this is the pre and post. And uh, let me see now if I want to be able to take this one out. All right. So I think uh, uh, it might uh, be quite clear that uh, the uh, MR is also a bit less. Uh, the gradient, the peak gradient is 11, and mean gradient was 4. Lo and behold, on this chart, his uh, QRS complex came back to narrow complex. So I was very happy with that. Uh, and this was about the uh, fourth post RVD. So that's uh, at least encouraging for us. Uh, he came back for two weeks. Uh, he has no more breathlessness. Uh, he had minimal ankle edema, but he felt weak and tired. His hemoglobin was 8.2, and uh, you know, uh, and the concern about his hemodynamic, uh, hemo hematological uh, problems has not been solved yet. We transfused one pint of blood, and he was much better after that. I think, and to summarize this case, uh, I we have tried to stress that uh, the pre-procedure workup is extremely crucial together with careful target planning. Uh, essentially a two-day echo, CT angiogram, and if you need to, a coronary angiogram. Uh, this will help to decide on the vascular access, the valve sizing and placement, the pre and post balloon uh, UT bubble plus if required, and the anticipation of on-table issues and complications. The heart team approach is still essential. It's good to have, uh, you know, to be part of the team. Um, when you decide on the planning, a TAVI procedure, stick to the plan as much as possible because you have thought about it. Uh, you need to avoid shortcuts, especially I just wanted to show uh, that the wire was not placed nicely, but uh, we wanted to be sure we go in and did it in the proper way. And most times you do not need to do it in a rush. Uh, you know, sometimes, of course, there is a need to, because when you, for example, 
BAV and it causes severe aortic regurg. So the valve must be ready. There's a reason the valve has to be ready. As an example, one needs to be careful with vascular excess because this is one of the major complications for any TAVI from uh, you know TAVI procedure. BAV, of course, the risk of complete heart block, and if you oversize the concerns about anal rupture and needing, and most, most times leading to death. And remember, tamponade that can be caused by the temporary wire, uh, and also the LV wire, because the LV wire has got a transition point which is stiff, and if you don't take care, it might uh, stress, put a, a, a pressure onto the left ventricle and cause perforation. And this is where the confida wire is very nice. Uh, bundle branch block, most times they will recover or remain stable. We've had, uh, uh, in, in the past, when I was in IGEN, we had uh, uh, two patients, I remember, but they still remain in sinus rhythm, despite the fact that they were on, they're having left bundle branch block. And it, most times are not, it does not require uh, a permanent pacemaker. I know I've taken a lot of time, uh, but uh, I just want to illustrate that uh, this are, is a, how a typical TAVI case, we, when, if ever we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, any, Further webinars, for example, we can showcase some of the other issues. So, for example, the vascular access, a small valve analyst that uh, you can even try to put in, uh, 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 try to treat with TAVI. But in the end, I would really like to say that TAVI is really satisfying because you can see the difference uh, in patients before and after the procedure. So, thank you very much for your, uh, for your uh, attention. Thanks. Thanks, Rosalie. That was a great uh, sharing of uh, that wonderful case that we did recently. There have been a number of questions that has come in. That some are directed uh, directly to you. Oh, all right. And I would like to maybe just highlight uh, to one question from Shaifo first. He asked, why not in this particular case perform TEE to see the mitral ring and the uh, mitral window better? Right. I, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, if we put a patient on GA, we tend to put a TEE. Uh, in the, in uh, an earlier case last year, when we also did a mitral valve, we put on a TE, we deployed the valve until just before the annular, uh, and until before we do the final uh, deployment and see how it affected the mitral valve. When it did not affect the mitral valve, then we deployed fully. That was a slightly higher position. In this case, the anesthetist is concerned that the patient has uh, esophageal varices. So he says, no, we're not going to do, uh, I know he, he's not comfortable with it. And we said, okay, uh, we will go along with it. Yeah, I think that we've been using quite a bit of TE to help us to assess the, the procedure um, even before and after the TAVI. And it this does help us very much in terms of some of the decision-making process as well. So many experienced operators think that it may not be truly necessary, but it's been helpful in a number of uh, occasions. Now, there is a, oh, you want to transfer that by speed by valve by Lima? I have, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I have answered to, uh, on by in writing actually. All right, okay. The question for you from Lima Sayami, uh, maybe they need to understand. They ask why is the device position in the right coronary cusp? Oh, because uh, that's the point that you are able to see all the three leaflets uh, clearly, and uh, you know you don't want to be putting in a, a, like just now when I did show the pictures, uh, when you put in the cast, you can't see the right coronary cast very well. And when you don't see all the three casts well, uh, you, you are not very sure where the line, the annular, uh, you know, annular position is. So when you can't see it, there's a potential that you may not place it well, you may place it too high, and you miss the annulus uh, uh, yeah, from the very word goal. So I think it's very important to first see all the three leaflets uh, all the three analysts, and from there you can uh, see the uh, analyst clearly and you position the valve uh, appropriately, correctly. Do you, uh, do you post dilate most of your procedures? Uh, how do you decide which one needs a post dilatation? Well, I believe that it depends on uh, how bad the calcification are. If you have bad calcification, then uh, you would be better off uh, to dilate it because if you don't dilate it, uh, then when you put, uh, place the device, the device doesn't open up, you have got severe AR, and uh, you can cause hemodynamic uh, instability. We had one patient, I remember before, severe valve, even after pre we had that problem, and we had to quickly put in uh, another bigger balloon to post dilate the, uh, the, the valve. So severe calcification, yes. If the calcification is not, it's only mild, 
uh, then you can even consider direct, uh, uh, you know, direct uh, deployment. Uh, in our case, we decided that you know, as we start along, we just said, why not uh, do it? It's, it doesn't really matter. It's quite safe. You just, of course, you just use one extra balloon. But uh, at least you know that uh, when your device goes through, there is no uh, hemodynamic uh, instability, especially when in severe valve, when you put the device through, there's hardly any flow, and uh, that's when uh, you can uh, develop uh, hypertension, and you need to act very fast. So if you want to run it fairly safe, then you, uh, it will be good to do a pre-dilatation. So that's the pre, but also I just want to add on, um, similarly, in line with the question about the bicuspid, they tend to be very calcified. So always a good practice to really pre-dilate uh, before you actually deploy the valve for bicuspid valve stenosis. The other reason why you want to pre-dilate, sometimes you have small aneurysms, you're worried that you may occlude the coronaries and so on. You want to test whether the leaflets during the DAV does occlude the coronary ostia. You can actually inflate the balloon, take an aortic root injection and see whether the coronaries are compromised. That helps you to sort of anticipate possibility of occlusion of the coronary uh, after deploying the, the valve. Uh, Rosie, the question is that more for post dilatation. How do you decide whether you need to post dilate? Uh, it's uh, we go by the pressure gradient. I think uh, um, and if you see that the pressure is uh, there is still a significant amount of pressure, and you feel that, and you can see from the angiogram, you see whether the at the valve or the annular side is whether it's uh, well expanded or not. If you find that it's not well expanded, then this and the, there's still a gradient, then you need uh, to dilate this. That's firstly. Secondly is uh, also paravalvular leak. Uh, if let's say there's a significant paravalvular leak, then you need to try to expand the, uh, you know, the, the, the frame better. So once you exp expand the frame better, then uh, that will reduce uh, the paravalvular leak. With the new devices like S3 and also the uh, uh, Evolut uh, Pro, they have got this, uh, 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 you know, they have got an extra skirting to reduce this, so that would be helpful. But that's where the uh, the main reasons are for you to post dilate uh, when a valve is uh, deployed. Okay, so that answered your question, Hongbang, about um, pyrovalvular leak. But also, Hong Bang asked, what is our strategy for the uh, anticoagulation, anti-thrombotics um, anti after procedure? Yeah. Uh, of course, heparin is uh, on board during the procedure, and we tend uh, to use uh, what is recommended at this point, general recommendation, of using dual antiplatelet therapy for at least uh, three to six months uh, before you go on uh, for uh, just a single antiplatelet. Um, the only reason, uh, if at all, you need to do uh, and give anticoagulation uh, for uh, a, a certain duration is when after your, uh, your, uh, your, your procedure, everything goes on well, you follow up, everything is all right, and then you start to find that there is an increasing gradient, much, much more than what it was before. Then it is imperative that you have to rule out uh, leaflet thrombosis and you have to do a CT scan. And you want to see, uh, and of course, an echo to see whether any leaflet is uh, opening well which is difficult unless you do a uh, transesophageal echo. So if there's leaflet thrombosis, you have to give anticoagulation. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. if atrial patient and atrial fibrillation, you will have to give anticoagulation anyway. Uh, Tim Timothy D is online. He's um, yeah. congratulated you for the beautiful lecture, but he's asking how do you size your balloon for pre-dilatation to check for coronary uh, occlusion? All right, okay. Uh, there are two things here. Number one is uh, the size that you choose for uh, a valve. We tend not to be aggressive when you want to pre-dilate. So if, let's say you're going to use a 26, or if we use as much uh, a smaller valve, like a balloon like 22 mm, which is just enough because you just want to dilate it and then place a device in. Uh, so that's important. The concern is when you have the coronary ostia is very, you know, uh, is uh, fairly short. You know, when you're talking about 10 mm, then you're going to be concerned, especially when uh, the sinus of Valsalva is not large. If the sinus of Valsalva is quite large, even uh, if the coronary ostia is fairly short, it's okay because there'll be, uh, you know, there'll be uh, blood that is able to flow through the uh, struts into the artery. That's quite all right. The, first, the problem is when you have a short ostia to annulus and also at the same time a small uh, sinus of Valsalva. Uh, that can be an issue. Uh, 
Of course, AdWords is a much uh, smaller or shorter device. You can uh, tend to think about using it. But uh, we've had, I think, two, two cases of that nature mm -hmm. uh, over here, last one year. So what we did is we used the balloon. And when we inflate the balloon, and then we injected uh, contrast and see whether it's going to be uh, the flow is impeached or not. If the flow is not, then we're quite uh, safe. Uh, you know, we don't, we, we're quite safe in deploying the valve alone. If in any event, if let's say it occludes the artery, or for example, when you take the leaflet and you inflate the leaflet, the leaflet goes up and close the coronary artery, especially the left main, then it is important for you to wire into the, con the artery. And uh, for me, I would place a stand there. So when I deploy the device, about eight, even at uh, 80 degrees, 80%, you know that uh, uh, the flow is going to be affected. And if it is, then I deploy the stand. So those are the steps. Yes, in certain situations, you have to check the primary flow, especially when the osteo is short. And the sinus of Balsalva is not large. Yeah. So sometimes we can anticipate that there may be some issues, and these are the ways that we prevent that. Um, there's always this question also that the coronaries can be also occluded by the native valve, which is outside the frame. But there's also the issue of the commissure of the, the, um, the tavir may be actually near where the coronary ostea is. And many times when you implant these, uh, these devices, we are, we is all a random where the commission of the valve would land. If it lands in front of the ostea, there's higher risk of uh, occlusion and a problem with the re-access. Uh, we are learning a lot more. There has been some nice uh, data uh, suggesting that, for example, for the balloon, uh, the self-expandable platform, there are certain ways where you actually advance the, uh, the device that can give less chance of that commissure being actually uh, overlying the, uh, co the coronary ostea. This was from, I think, Gilbert Tang and in, the, in the Mount Sinai. It's a very nice paper on how you position when you deliver the uh, self expandable valve. If you have an interest, you can look at that, that uh, particular paper. I think Estacio uh, 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 asked one question. Uh, too much, okay. What do you do when there is too much movement of valve? Do you pace patient or do, I think that that's what we did in this case. We just pace at 120. You don't have to go uh, too low. Just get it down to about 80 or 90. Um, and then you can uh, safely, uh, safely uh, no, uh, uh, deploy the valve slowly. Sometimes nowadays, when you, um, when you need a small valve, a small analyst, for example, you just deploy slowly, allow it to expand, deploy a bit more, allow it to expand. And then when you have another contact, then you deploy until 80%. Uh, by doing that, you allow the valve, uh, the frame to open by itself and become stable and helps to stabilize the whole uh, uh, device. And then you can pull back. So sometimes it's better to just uh, deploy slowly as you go along. Yeah. So Hongbang asked, do we use a temporary wire pacing or do we use the guide wire to pace? Ah, OK. Uh, we, we tend to use, Neil, we tend to use a pen temporary pacemaker because remember, the, uh, we, if we use, especially if we use a volute, uh, we keep the temporary pacemaker for at least one day because the valve uh, keeps on expanding. And especially in this case, for example, you saw the QRS complex being broad. You need to place that valve uh, for an, a while. Secondly, if you use the wire, uh, sometimes the wire can actually move, uh, especially the, during the time that uh, you uh, place uh, the balloon and the device, and you're not sure whether it's going to uh, be in good contact all the time. So I believe in that sense, uh, a TPM, which, which uh, would be much better. Yeah. So, and then once we see there are some conduction abnormalities, or, uh, we, we can predict that this patient may require a, a permanent pacemaker, so we, we may want to watch them a bit longer. There has been some nice... Uh, some uh, studies recently to say that after the procedure, you can actually try to pace the atrium at about 100, 120. If the patients develop a wanky bark conduction, that predicts that this patient is more likely to need uh, some form of permanent uh, pacemaker. So these are the things that we are looking out for in terms of trying to predict which patient might need a, a, a permanent pacemaker. I think, oh yeah, someone, Ribaldo Estaccio asked, do you have any experience with the Boston valve? 
No, we don't have it uh, yet over here, uh, Ronaldo. You probably will be able to share it with us. Uh, you know, uh, we didn't have it uh, before it was taken off the shelf and uh, made uh, some amendments or correction to it. So you probably be able to tell us better. Okay. So I think we have, I think more or less, responded to most of the questions. I think it's been really a great um, attendance. I'm really happy for all of you who have attended. I think some of them are uh, checking out already. No, don't, 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 don't check it out yet, please, if you don't mind. Uh, I think Sean wants to ask some uh, uh, polling questions. If you don't mind, just stay back because it's useful because they will want to use it. Uh, in, uh, we have some, yeah. some sort of uh, polling and some uh, feedback that we'd like to get from you. If you could, uh, we just put on the slides and help us to understand your your uh, appreciation of this session and whether we should be doing more sessions and what kind of sessions in the future. So let's uh, look at that. The polling questions are up in your panel on your right. If not, you can open them up and try to help us to rate this webinar. And we would like also you to maybe inform us what would you like us to address some areas that would be of interest to you with regards to Tavi. And what would be a best time that you think for us to come together and share um, uh, information about Tavi? Um, as you do that, I want to again thank Dr. Rosley for that excellent sharing. I want to thank Boss, uh, this, um, sorry, this uh, uh, Medtronic who have done so much to help us with this uh, event. I think they've been very supportive and uh, very good to have good partners to help us in, in the program as well in this kind of education. I want to thank all of you for responding to our invitation to come and join us. We hope that you learned something and we were so happy to share with you. Even after the webinar, you can write to us or email to us or, or get to us through the Medtronic context. We will try to address your, your issues or questions that you have. We hope that we will be able to benefit more patients who need this transcatheter technology for their aortic stenosis. We hope that we will be able to grow together to, to sort of pass this benefit to all our patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Rossi. Last words from you. Uh, again, once again, I would like to thank uh, everyone for participating, Medtronic for having uh, holding this, and of course CVSKL for the support that they have uh, in terms of trying to for us to reach out and trying to share our experience because Tavi is uh, very new, and I feel that we are uh, not thinking enough uh, for our patients, and sometimes we tend to say, "Oh, you're too old," you know, uh, but really it's uh, not just. Uh, quality of life, but we also look at longevity as person, especially when they start to deteriorate. It's fairly early uh, when they are uh, active and well before. So we need to, uh, you know, to inform our population better, our own fraternity, medical fraternity, about uh, TAVI. Uh, and it's been done in a lot of other countries, and it's been done in the countries uh, in where people are participating. And I'm glad that at least they, can, they have come on board to, you know, to uh, participate in that. And who knows, uh, we can have a session where, you know, in webinar that we can actually have uh, different centers uh, sharing uh, their uh, cases, uh, especially when, it, uh, you know, it comes to more complex cases. And we hope to have this uh, in, in, the, in the future uh, events. So thank you once again, friends. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.